Life will present you with people and circumstances to reveal where you're not free. What happened happened and couldn't have happened any other way because it didn't. Exactly, yes. Welcome back to Max Out, everybody. I'm so excited about today. My guest is a mind architect. I think he's the best in the world at it. I've become a huge fan of his work. Um, Peter Crone is my guest, everybody, first of all. So, Peter, welcome to Max Out with Ed Milet. Welcome to our family. Thank you so much. It's a privilege and an honor to be with you, my friend. I've been looking forward to this conversation for a while. So have I. And uh, for so many reasons, mainly which I love my audience and I know how much you're going to help them today. And I'm so honored to, for some of them, introduce you to them for the first time. I'm sure some of them are obviously very familiar with your work. And I am. Just so you all know, Peter is a very unique man. Um, so eloquent. But the way he approaches the mind and changing our lives, and he's worked with very well-known people, professional athletes in the corporate space, executives. And today we get access to them for free, which is super cool. So <laughs> I think I find you at such a good time because I think so many people right now may be struggling with some of their emotions. You know, yeah. there's been a curveball thrown this year for an awful lot of people. And I think, you know, you and I are both sort of about helping human beings reach their ultimate potential, their ultimate yeah. happiness. Absolutely. And you have a, a message that sort of, I want to start in the past, ironically, because okay. I think part of your philosophy, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but it's these misconceptions, these false beliefs that we attach to our past, yeah. that is maybe most ultimately impacting our present and our future. Could, could you correct. talk about that a little bit? Yeah. So, I mean, beautifully articulated. You're obviously a smart cat and that's why I feel there's a lot of synergy between us. But um, one of the things I, one of the primary things that I look at for a human being is how do we relate to time, right? There's certain constructs that we function within by virtue of the dimension that we're here as human, right? So space and time are the sort of the fundamental fabric of our experience. And particularly how the human brain relates to time, it's quite fascinating. So without going too deep, but let's go straight there. Um, it's, it's an illusion to think there's anything ad that we call a past or a future, which right out of the gate is a little bit mind blowing for people because mind and you know the way that we relate to time is all simultaneously occurring at the moment. So past and future are nothing but constructs in language. You've never been in your history and you've never been in your future. So what's actually occurring in the brain is you're having a narrative, a dialogue that is based in past tense language or future based language. So when that really hit me, it was just so profound. I realized I was never worried about the future. I was always worried about my thoughts about a presumed future. So I was actually worried about the thoughts I was having in current time. Which is why when people have anxiety or fear or apprehension or concern, when I'm working with my athletes, you know, they've got this pressure, of whatever it be, a guy on a Sunday who's in contention at a PJ Tour event, a guy who's close to throwing a no-hitter no from the mound, uh, whatever it is, it's game seven of the World Series, you know, I had a guy from the Chicago Cubs who uh, was involved in that uh, when they won. You know, there's this perception of pressure, but pressure is based on our own, our own perception of a future that hasn't happened yet. And it's occurring in the moment, which gives rise to the emotional experience of fear, which we're seeing all around the world right now, right? People are either scared of what's going to happen with this like deadly bug, you know, the virus that people are concerned about. What is the concern? Am I going to get it? Well, what's deeper beneath that is, am I going to be okay? And fundamentally, the biggest relationship we have to life is ironically death. So people aren't actually worried about a virus and they're not worried about whether they get it. What they're worried about is the impact, and especially as it relates to their mortality, all of which is happening right here. So when we change our relationship to time, we change our relationship to life. And when you realize that the only thing that you're ever up against is your own thought processes, it is absolutely transformational. So oh I don't know how that is for a start. <laughs> my God, we went way deep. Well, first we went into your brilliance and uh, it's really interesting. I wanna, I wanna unpack that just a little bit from my sure. own understanding. So yeah. I, we both work with athletes and you use the example of golfers. I have a few too. And one of the things that I do say to them is you really don't have anxiety over this putt. What you've done is you've projected into the future. If you miss this putt, what it's going to feel like, what people are going to say, what your yeah. reputation is going to be. You've also projected into the future. If you make the putt, what it's going to look like. Yeah. So is that sort of, is that to some extent what you're saying? And then secondly, how does that apply for, say an everyday person, how does one begin to change their relationship? Is it just being conscious of what you just said? 
reminding yeah. yourself of that? Or is there something I can do to change my relationship to time? Um, amazing. So yes, is the first part of your question, right? So that does relate to whether guys worried about missing a putt. I actually had a client, he was, he wasn't actually a pro golfer. He was a scratch golfer. He'd won his club championship a couple of times. Um, and he was a phenomenal hedge fund guy. He was great with finance, but because of his success in golf, there was this sort of impression that he had, that he had to sustain that, which create this feeling of pressure, pressure. If you understand the principles of pressure, as much as I'm like a spiritual teacher to many, I'm really a physicist, right? So if you, I always use the analogy of a garden hose lying on the ground. If there's water flowing through it at a consistent speed, like the force that is just set or whatever opening it is, the water is flowing through uninter uninterrupted. But if you put your foot slightly on the hose, it reduces the amount of space. So that's one component. When you reduce space, the water has to travel at an increased velocity to get through the same square footage area because of the volume that's coming through, right? Yeah. So now if you apply that to the, to the very subtle channels of our mind and how things happen and certainly our circulatory system is when we have slight pressure, everything moves quicker. Isn't that cool? Yeah. So what happens is the power of the mind is so in, insane when your friend or the guy you're helping around a three foot part and he doesn't want to miss, what's actually occurring is he's literally, literally becoming physiologically a different human being by virtue of the fact that his chemistry is changing, his heart rate, his respiratory rate and his blood pressure. So what he's accustomed to doing in a completely altered state he now is very unfamiliar in a new state based on the principle of perspective that's giving him a perception of pressure. Therefore, he's not so accustomed, he doesn't have the same confidence, or she, obviously it applies to both, to be able to execute what he would normally do, quote unquote, in his sleep. So, so it's, it's so beautiful when you understand how mind is truly informing physiology, which is then impacting behavior and result. My gosh. <laughs> this is too early in the show. This is so good. So I want everyone to listen to this brilliant man because you have to, when you listen to something like that, everybody, I think one of the things that you have to do is how does this apply to me? So perhaps you're unemployed right now. And yeah. this future projection of applying to the hose of your life about I've got to be perfect on this call. I've got to do this. How yeah. it impacts your performance. If you're thinking about your financial situation, all of those different things how they apply to you. And if you can alter your relationship to time, it's just amazing to me the way that you say that. It helps yeah. me because I think I have a tendency to do that to some extent. I'll yes. forward, I think oftentimes achievers are dreamers. Yeah. And I think there's this nuance maybe between being yeah. a dreamer and, and dreaming of a future yeah. and something that you want better. Yeah. Yet navigating being in the present since to your point, this future doesn't really exist, which is- No, it's totally is, fictitious. So the second part of your question about what could we do, and it's less about doing. Doing is in the realm of physical behavior or action. My well, you know, you, you, you said, is it just to having the awareness of it? And that is the first step. You've got to recognize the pattern. I'll tell a lot of people, it's not you, it's a pattern, yes. right? So it's a piece of code based in dialogue, which was accumulated over time, invariably started in childhood, that has created an identity by which people are defined which creates the experience emotionally of anxiety, fear, and then the consequential behaviors and results, right? So that's the cascade. So what I'm undoing is reverse engineering. Okay, well, you have an issue with whatever the outcome is, right? You're not getting paid enough. You have some physical ailments. You have a relationship problem. You're not satisfied in your career. So that's the external manifestation. That's the symptom. But everything that happens is a byproduct, the result of action. Right, action is the the inextricable precursor to whatever happens. Now, if we understand action is the byproduct of a combination of feelings and thoughts, now we start to get into the meat of okay, well, what's the actual software driving human behavior, which will lead to results? So, why my work is so immensely powerful, and I say that objectively, not just because I'm doing it, is because if you change the code of somebody's subconscious mind, they have no choice but to think, feel, act, and then consequently get different results. That's power, right? So what, what I love about how much you care about your audience is, yes, everybody's experiencing this, whether they play golf or they don't, whether they're just worried about paying rent this month or they're worried about putting food on the table or they're concerned about being furloughed and are they going to have a job? Whatever the fundamental concern is, it still belongs to the same principles of physics, which is your mind is creating a perception of a future that hasn't happened yet 
and it's eliciting a, a physiological syst uh, systemic response called fear, worry, anxiety. Now, that doesn't make anyone wrong, that's human. Why? Because the primordial incentive of any organism is to survive. Survival is what drives people. And if you have a thought that is in any way jeopardizing your perception of survival, then you have no choice but to do whatever you feel you have to do in order to mitigate that. Mm -hmm. So again, I tell people, most people are trying to avoid a bad future that hasn't happened yet. <laughs> now, if you just get that, you wonder why people, or you don't wonder why people are so exhausted, right? Or they have to talk to their doctor or have a drink at night. None of which I have any judgment over, but you start to get some sovereignty and domain over your behaviors as opposed to being victims of them and go holy shit my anxiety my depression my addiction my relationship woes my physiological dis-ease is a byproduct of my psychological programming through no fault of my own and that i have some say over and that gives people such a position of empowerment and it is the ultimate form of liberation because you come out of the cage of your own mind versus constantly trying to fix circumstance which is exhausting and futile. <laughs> My gosh, I, I have to tell you, um, I think where we're going right now is uh, if, if everyone could hear what you just covered and what I'm gonna ask you now, because I have some inclination as to some of the brilliant way you articulate this. You touched on a couple things there. We could heal the planet, by the way. Yeah, sorry, they're, they're gonna be gone in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> they're gonna be riveted in sharing this, trust me. But I, you know, this idea that you talked a little bit about childhood, and um, one of the things I've said for years, people say I'm the first one to say it, I probably wasn't. I say everything is happening for me and not to me. Correct. I say it a little bit differently, but it's beautiful. And one of the things that always strikes me, even when I meet achievers, like people you and I were talking about right before we went on uh, live here on camera, yeah. is how often, no matter what someone's accomplished in their life or has not accomplished, that at some point early in knowing them, they are compelled to tell me about their childhood. Yeah. In other yeah. words, it seems to me that this is a conversation, a video running in the back of so many people's minds. And oftentimes it doesn't serve them, meaning they're overcoming something. They think that those circumstances that happened to them were somehow imperfect. Yeah. And I've watched you work with people on this and it's just amazing which, how it transforms their heart yeah. and how this love begins to pour out of people when yeah. they come to this reconciliation, this breakthrough mentally that yeah. you got so, there are literally millions of people who are watching this who have a past or an impression they have a past that yeah. is imperfect somehow, yeah. that they're overcoming, that's yeah. caused them to be the way they are and create these patterns. Everyone, wait till you hear what this man says regarding this topic. So go ahead. I'm, I'm going to unleash you here. Well, you're yeah, very kind. I, I mean, what comes to mind, and maybe you're speaking to this, is one of my favorite quotes. I write in quotes. Anyone who's familiar with my work, I write in quotes which sort of transcend traditional thinking. And it kind of gives you that, wait a minute, I think you just said something profound. I got to cheer with that. So one of the ones that come to mind, my quote is, what happened happened and couldn't have happened any other way because it didn't. Exactly. Yes. Now, when people get that, the experience invariably is for, for most people who are ready to hear it, they're like, wow, that is incredibly liberating. For those people who have had very troublesome, maybe even traumatic or abusive histories, it takes a minute for them to be able to integrate because I am not saying that what happened was easy. I'm not saying that what happened was perfect. I'm not saying that what you experienced, I would condone that behavior. You know, certainly people I help who've had abuse of some kind. So for me, it is not condoning a history or saying that it was exactly the way you wanted it. It is nonetheless what happened. And when we can recognize that I'm still here, I was orphaned by the age of 17. My mom died of cancer 107. My dad went to work one day on the boats that went between England and France and England and Belgium, never came back. He was lost in a fatal accident. So would I say that was ideal? No, that's not what I'm saying. But that is what happened. And the degree to which I can find harmony and acceptance with that is the degree to which I find freedom, which my assertion is that's what every human being is looking for. They think it's to be found with more money, a better body, the right partner. They don't want any of those things. If I gave someone 10 million bucks, you know, in a big duffel bag and stuck them under my staircase and locked the door, they're not going to be happy, but they got the 10 million bucks, right? It's the idea of what something's going to give you. We're fundamentally, we're chasing a feeling. Yes. And so that quote, what happened, happened and couldn't have happened any other way because it didn't is at least the access to reconciling your history. Now it gets deeper. So everybody is under the impression you can change your future. First of all, that's an illusion, right? Because all you're changing is what could have happened because whatever's going to happen is always what's going to happen. Again, that's a very 
you know, it's a bit of a, a mind twister. But where, what I learned as my, re, my relationship to time shifted is I can actually change people's history. Mm. Now, that seems like, like out of this world, esoteric, magical. Now, I'm not saying that I changed the facts. My dad died when I was 17 by virtue of the fact that he was in a fatal accident. That cannot be changed. What I did change was my narrative about it. And therefore, my history changed. Yes. Now, that gives me chills, right? Because I know you've been through a lot. And obviously, recently, and I, you know, you, I support you and I send much love for what you've been through personally with your dad. But when we can look at our history, and look at the narratives that are associated with our history, that is the access to true power. Because none of us have been a victim of circumstance, like you said, but rather the beneficiaries of it. And one of, again, one of my favorite quotes I say is that life will present you with people and circumstances to reveal where you're not free. And that to me is this dimension that we're in, is that you will always attract the partner, the friend, the business, the opportunity, the loss, whatever it is that you go through in order to reveal where you're still confined. And that is the gift of life. Is that because of this, you have some sort of a psychological relationship with your impression of your past? Is that what's yeah. happening there? Yeah, so I'm unpairing event with emotion. PTSD is where people have still got an emotional and it's a, it's a collapsed and attached to an event. Mm -hmm. So to be able to disassociate my personal experience of an event and just look at it as an event mm -hmm. is where I recognize my sovereignty and my deeper spirituality. Again, for whatever reason, all these quotes are coming to mind. I say, you know, if it's not life threatening, it's just ego threatening. Oh, so all that's ever getting threatened, unless you really need to call 911 or someone's at your door with a gun, you know, it's really just the psychological aberration in the way that you're relating to time, which is ego threatening. You're under the impression that you're not going to be okay, but which you, the you that you perceive yourself to be. So even with this whole COVID nonsense, you know, people are worried about themselves, their identity, not their physiology. If I was a fortune teller and whoever's worried about COVID and I said, no, no, you're going to get it and you're going to be fine, like 99.9% .9 of the population, yeah. then their whole experience to their projected future would suddenly shift and they'd be like, oh, it's okay. <laughs> I mean, just yeah. based on a, a reposition of their own narrative and their perception of a future, again, that hasn't happened yet. The default of the human mind tends to be from fear. That's the issue. So what most people speculate towards is a worst case scenario. I take one of my MBA guys who was shooting the worst average in the league, 37%, 35 point, uh, 37.5. And I went to his house, live locally here. And um, I you know, was talking about everything he goes through when he's at the free throw line. And you can imagine, right? He's getting paid millions of dollars at the time. There were like thousands of thousands of fans screaming. There's millions watching. And there's this, this feeling of inadequacy, letting down his team, like the embarrassment of being yes. a pro who can't make a free throw or shitty average. The league average was 75. I'm sitting there in his kitchen, right? And I say, Okay, what if I told you for the rest of the season, it was like month one of the, the season, I said, for the rest of the season, you shoot, you shoot league average. How would you feel? His face lit up like a little kid who first picked up a basketball. And he's like, dude, that would be amazing. I said, can I just tell you something? I said, what I just proposed to you, that future is as real as the one that you're worried about. Why? Because none of them have happened. We're still sitting in your kitchen. <laughs> He went on to shoot that whole week, 67%, and then went on and part of the Olympics and whatever. Now, again, the guy's got immense talent. It's not all because of me. I'm just helping him to look through different eyes. And more profoundly, to go back to something you said earlier, one of my quotes, again, I say, past hurt informs future fear. Past, so whenever we Past hurt informs future fear. Correct. So wherever we've had disappointments, letdowns, failures, and in this case, using my athlete or any of my athletes who've had some sort of disappointment, then what happens is the mind, because it's designed to predict and protect, it naturally is going to be looking out for the repetition of something that hurt or was disappointing. That's survival. But what happens is, unbeknownst to the individual, they're sustaining and perpetuating the very thing they're trying to avoid. Golly. <laughs> Madness, right? Yeah. You make me, there's very few shows where... I'm in my own thoughts as the, you know, I'm completely in my own thoughts, right. reflecting on something with me. Uh, most of any stress or anxiety I give myself, even as a grown man um, yeah. who helps people with these things. And I'm sure even you, you know, one of the things that people should know is that 
guys like you and I, we've come to these conclusions out of necessity for ourselves. And yep. these are things that even we navigate in our own lives and we have our own breakthroughs. And most of the time, even at my age, if I'm creating any stress for myself, it's my pr projected future thought about what it will look like to someone else. And yep. one of the powers of having, I'll share this with you, one of the powers of having my dad pass away and one of the blessings of it and being there while it happened mm -hmm. was in those moments, all the things, you know what my dad wasn't doing in those beautiful moments? Any of the things we're describing that hurt us. He yeah. wasn't projecting into the future. He right. wasn't worried about what everybody thought about him. He wasn't worried about a bad or a good choice. Yeah. And those things sort of go away when you realize there's an inevitability eventually to all of this anyways. So yeah. we might as well be in the present moment and enjoy it because even in that moment, that's the present moment. And oftentimes yeah. people will say to me, I've got to make a decision between A and B. And I often tell the people I coach, what if both of them are good choices? Yeah. There's this false notion we have in our mind. That's the right choice. That's the wrong choice. I don't yeah. want to make the wrong choice. Yeah. We've got a belief system that both could work. Both ended up in the right place. And yeah. I think the reason, and I want you to talk about this because you're the expert at this, is this, there's this notion of personal development that, that is a kind of a, I don't know if it's a battle, but it's a, it's who's right, who's wrong type thing. And I think both are right. And it's this, yeah. it's people, I think there's this not enoughness feeling with so many people. I'm not enough. Yeah. Yeah. And so there's people like you and I who are saying you are enough. What if you were actually perfect? Yeah. What if there was actually nothing wrong with you, right? Yeah. How would you live your life? Yeah. And then there's this other notion people say, well, you can't tell people that when they're laying around eating Cheetos all day long, that you're enough, you're enough, you're enough, because it sends the message yeah. to them that they don't need to change. Yeah. That, that, that what they're doing is enough. Yeah. So what are your thoughts about that nuance between those two things and, and that disease? Because I think yeah. everything else is the symptom, the disease yeah. of I'm not enough. No, I love it. And this is why we're clearly brothers from other mothers and I can't wait to connect in person. But uh so the way I look at it again is the construct we're in, planet Earth, the experience of being human is by design a relative experience. What does that mean? We are in the world of duality, right? We would not know other and unless it were, for, would not know ourselves unless it were for other, right? So if I'm lying in bed at night, if anyone is, and you kind of feel a little hot and you move your leg to one side, and it's a little cooler, that experience is only generated by the laws of relativity. Ooh. Right. So the actual paradigm that we're in is based on the laws of relationship, which is why relationships are usually the number one conversation that anyone has. Right. Because that's where they think their bugaboos are. That's where they get pissed off. My boss is an asshole. My wife, this, that. Right. That's because that's where you're having an experience which has got nothing to do with them. Nothing. What it is doing, it is eliciting whatever it is in you that you still haven't reconciled. Right. So that's the real power is rather than trying to control or get someone else to be different, they shouldn't have done that. They should do this. It's like, I didn't get the memo that you're in charge of the freaking universe. Like, you know, how's that working out for you? Let me know what I'm supposed to do for your side. You know, it's like, so anyway, so as it relates to all of that, that world of duality, I love what you're saying. And obviously, you have such a huge heart of compassion for people, whether the guy's eating Cheetos or someone's at the gym at five o'clock every morning and looking like the elite athlete. To me, there's no such thing as wrong. Wrong is a subjective narrative. It doesn't exist in the world of mother nature. It is a human generated conversation. That does again, not to condone behavior. Somebody steals a car, they break into someone's house, God forbid they physically abuse someone. I'm not saying any of that is good. I, I live in the world of physics and physics has consequences. Doing heroin is not wrong, but it's gonna have consequences. If you have an ox constitution, you'll probably survive longer than if you're quite frail. Right. So again, it's physics is playing out. So the guy eating Cheetos, that's his current karma or, she, you know, that's what she has been, you know, programmed by virtue of what she saw, the icons of her care providers of mom and dad. And that's what they bought. And so that's what she's become accustomed to. You know, you grow if you grow up in Madrid, you learn to speak Spanish just by virtue of your environment. Right. Doesn't make them bad. I always give, give the example of a 16 year old kid is on my street right now, smashing some neighbor's car window because he sees an iPhone. Is he a bad kid or is he a byproduct of his upbringing where his mom was a single parent, his dad was in jail, she sold drugs. The only sense of belonging that kid got was by virtue of a local gang. And his, his introduction to that gang, his initiation was that he had to contribute by stealing, getting money. And so that's what his conditioning is. I'm not saying it's ideal and there's gonna be consequences if he gets caught, but it breeds a lot more compassion. So we get out of this conversation of duality of wrong or right or good or bad, 
you know, and we start to look at like human beings as the byproduct of their conditioning, doing the best they can within the level of their current awareness and having the opportunity to contribute to that level of awareness such that they can make better choices to themselves. All right. Every time he talks, I'm just sort of processing information because I, <laughs> I think through some of the ways that I view it and, um, and you just say it a little bit differently than I do. And I was talking to a friend of mine this weekend. I wanted you to speak to this. And so, so it was a group of, uh, we're, we're at a place where wealthy people kind of hang out, like really wealthy people, you know? Yeah. And, uh, and he says to me, he goes, isn't it interesting how many, how many rich people are more unhappy than people that aren't rich? Yeah. And yeah. I've had this notion too, like it, people think, well, once I get a bunch of money, then I'll be happy. Once I get the relationship, as you said, once I get the body, you know, yeah, yeah, once yeah. I get the house, whatever it is. And, and I've come to the conclusion that it's not that rich people, people with money are less happy. It's that people that are less happy end up getting more money. Mm -hmm. And the reason is, is because it's some sort of a coping mechanism that they're trying to fill themselves up so that you end up with a lot of people that have acquired things in their life. And not all rich people are unhappy. There are plenty that are very happy. But yeah, my, yeah. No, my, my feeling is that we, we do this to sort of um, cover up or fill up a hole that's within us, whether it be, it could be the negative where we drink or heroin or, you know, or, yeah. uh, you know, binge eat or whatever it might be. And then the other side of it is there's positive, what society would say is positive things we do. But nonetheless, it's sort of the same behavior. Do you yeah. agree with that? And how do you how do you yeah. change that if it's a part of sort of your pattern now? A be beautiful question. I can see why you help so many people. So this goes back to where I wanted to address your previous question about not enoughness, which really is an epidemic, right? Yeah. So I would say that, that that lens, that construct that people are stuck in thinking they are somehow not enough is the adaptation or the adaptation arises from that, right? So now we could look at the, bi the bipolarism of that. Mm -hmm. Somebody who really buys into their insufficiency, their inadequacies, their not enoughness, as though that's who they are, could lead to the self-sabotaging kind of life that we've seen, where they get introduced to drugs or they drink a little too much, they become an alcoholic, and eventually, you know, it might take a few years, but perhaps say they end up on the streets, right? Don't wish that upon anyone. But to the lay person, it's like, well, that makes sense. You know, like they brought up in a family, they didn't experience love, they didn't do well at school, they weren't given a good education. And so the, the, the internal expression of not enoughness becomes manifest as an external representation. We can see that. The irony and what people don't understand is your friends who you're hanging out with or this particular community that you were talking about, where there's an immense amount of wealth, there's an abundance of materialism. I would assert are being driven by the same piece of code of I'm not enough. However, they forked in the road, not into buying it, but adapting to it. Mm. So some people prove it and some people are constantly trying to disprove it. Mm. Either way, you're being driven by the same mechanism. It's so fascinating. So when I work with very successful people, as I get the pleasure to do, I could equally be talking to somebody who is derelict, right? Because yeah. what I'm looking at is I don't need to know the details of their bank account or how much square footage they have in their house. What I'm looking at is what are the subconscious patterns that you've yet to transcend? Right. So if somebody could be a multi-billionaire, of which I've helped plenty, but they're still driven by the fact that at the deepest level, they feel that they're not loved or wanted by virtue of the relationship they had with their parents. Mm-hmm which is equally the same person who ends up as an addict on the streets who equally didn't have the same experience of love with their parents. Mm -hmm. But the way that we generate a response and an adapt adaptation or a compensation to that deep piece of code looks vastly different on the surface. Yeah. What would you but say to somebody who says, you're right, but it's working for me? In other words, uh, yeah, I am trying to prove my dad wrong yeah. or that yeah. coach that cut me. Yeah, or yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm Tom Brady and I got drafted in the sixth round. Now, I happen to know the Brady family. I don't believe that's why Tom is successful. This no. whole sixth round draft pick. I yeah. think his family comes from love. Yeah. And he's got a beautiful, loving family yeah. that has given him a rock solid internal identity. Yeah. But having said that, there are people listening to this going, hey, brother, I'd like a little bit more of this peace thing. Yeah, yeah. But I come from a place of wanting to overcome. It's got me to the NBA. It's got me to six figures. It's got me to seven figures. And I'm afraid, because this is real, Peter. I'm afraid, even though I know it's not very healthy for me, mm. I'm afraid if I let go of this pattern 
that is producing external results, yeah. that I'm going to lose my mojo. Yeah. It'll, be, it'll be kryptonite for superwoman. Yeah. So can you tell me how you feel about that? And is there another strategy, another place I can come from to create an abundance in my life that's even more powerful and more peaceful? Absolutely. So I like to use as many metaphors as I can. I think it helps people to take, you know, what I would consider to be very profound and make it palatable. Mm -hmm. So let's look at our physiology. There's not a human being on the planet who hasn't experienced the lactic acid buildup of some sort of urgent movement, whether they were literally sprinting in a race, they're running up and down in a game of pickup, you know, basketball with their friends, they're playing soccer, they're running to get a tennis ball, or they're just like late for the train. You know, and they get to the train and they got oxygen debt, right? I was trying to clear the lactic acid. That's one form of energy expression. And then we look at these guys who run like, you know, now sub three hour marathons, right? They're appealing to the aerobic system within our physiology. We got anaerobic, aerobic. So the question sort of, again, goes back to what I was saying about this world of duality. The mind wants to sort of, well, is it this or is it that? And I'm in the both camp, similar to you, right? So at times, using a little bit of like a chip on your shoulder could be the anaerobic method of like an, a, a bit of a fuck you. Yeah. And that's great. You know, like how many of my guys on the PJ tour, they do three bogeys in a row and they start to get a little frustrated. And then all of a sudden that energy, it might on the surface look like it's detrimental. It's causative in terms of like a buildup. It's not, it's de deleterious to their system. It's not harmonious. They're pissed, right? Yeah. But it leads to four or five birdies over the next seven holes. Yes. Oh, was that bad? No, it was a natural response. But I don't want them to play four days like that. They're never going to make it, Right. So again, it's like recognizing where do we use which resources? Now, yeah. I personally would rather favor love, aerobic, using the metaphor, versus fear, anaerobic, fight or flight, right? Fight or flight is phenomenal. It's part of your sympathetic nervous system. You're not going to get rid of it. It's just most people live there eternally. And yeah. then they wonder why they have Hashimoto's or their adrenals are shot because they're constantly pulling from a system that doesn't have that depth of resource. It's only to be used when you attend to something that requires a bit of an urgent situation. Otherwise, let's drift into parasympathetic. Let's be harmonious. That basketball player, the NBA guy I was talking about, he was in a perpetual state of fight or flight. He was worried about a future that hadn't happened by virtue of a history that was hurting the shit out of him. And he didn't even realize he's actually trying to fix his history, which is impossible, which is why it was you know, constantly there and is in the front of his face. Conversely, he found this sense of joy. He revisited his childlike uh, enamor with the sport. He had freedom. He's like, whatever happens, I don't know what's going to happen, right? And that pulled into this sense of relaxation, calm, compassion, and joy. So both systems apply. It's just to what degree are you imbalanced in the way that most people are, which is you're pulling from a limited resource anaerobically, physiologically, psychologically, fight or flight, dumping adrenaline and cortisol into your system, you are not going to be able to withstand that. So that's the difference. Uh, the best answer I've ever heard on that. And I, I have to say to everybody, you guys, I've sort of lived this. I spent the first, I don't know, I don't even know when it happened. I don't know, first 35 or maybe 40 years of my life pulling from those depleted resources of frustration, anger, overcoming, proving to people, those things. And it, it created an external life that was pretty beautiful. I was tired. I wasn't yeah. as happy. Yeah. Um, I don't think I spread as much. I actually think I missed what my capacity was as well. In other yeah. words, there's a limited threshold for that. I'm glad you said you never, you, know, you should never do it. But when I started to create out of, which I just admire so much about you, it's so obvious to me. When you see somebody's brilliance, their superpower on display, like you see with Peter, this is just somebody with their giftedness creating out of love. That's the ultimate expression of any human being is to yeah. create out of love. This happens to be Peter's genius. Yours may be cooking. Yours may be your nurturing skills. Your may be your athleticism. It could, it could, you've got a genius. All of you have a genius. Yeah. And I'm telling you, the most blissful pathway to do that is to create out of love for people. That doesn't mean, though, I love that you said that, because I have to tell you, sometimes I feel inauthentic because I am this guy who believes in creating out of love and gratitude. But I have days, weeks, moments, and certain projects that are not created out of that space sometimes yeah. for short windows of time. So it sort yeah. of makes me feel good to hear that from you, quite frankly. So how yeah, about yeah. this? I know you're a mindset guy, but is there something someone says, I just like a little bit more peace in my life. 
yeah. on a daily basis. Is there some practical ideas or thoughts you would share with them in you know, some of our final time here that, hey, you know, here's some thoughts I'd like you to consider thinking or some actions I'd have you consider doing on a regular yeah. basis? It's a beautiful question. I would assert actually it's what everyone's looking for. You know, they might be under the impression they want more money or they want a better body or the right one or whatever it is that we, of course, it's, it's fun to pursue, right? And certainly I don't want to in any way dismiss people who literally are surviving, right? There's a distinction between the psychological idea of survival where I don't want to look bad or I don't want anyone to sort of not like me or, you know, I'm not going to make my million dollar budget this month or, you know, like these are quote unquote first world problems, but there are literally people who are surviving. So I also want to make space for that conversation. I would still assert that regardless of how troubling your circumstances are, deal with physics versus your psychological reaction to physics, right? Because it's one thing to be in a difficult situation. It's another thing to be in a difficult situation with a mindset of fear, right? So now you've got difficulty with suffering. Let's at least remove the suffering. You become way more adept and proficient at dealing with life when you're not in a state of fear, right? So even where we feel, and I've been there, I can remember when I first got to the States, orphan, didn't have a penny to my name, my roommate was from a very wealthy family in Long Island. He would order food all the time. And that was, you know, growing up in England, that wasn't something that we typically did. We, we normally ate family food at home. Mum would cook or whatever. Someone would cook. So he, and I would see the receipts on his little brown bags, you know, and I'm like, God, the guy's spending like 21, 26, $31 on food. And I was blown away because I was eating pasta with ragu sauce, the cheapest generic one, you know, a treat once a week was a 59 cents can of tuna. You know? <laughs> So believe me, I can relate, right? Yep. But anyway, to come back to your question, peace. Peace to me is the is synonymous with success. To me, the most successful people are the ones who have discovered true peace. Now, this is the illusion. People are under the impression that peace is to be found when circumstances are in accordance with how our mind, our ego is saying they should be. That is not peace. That is exhaustion. That is manipulation. That is the attempt to control your environment. No bueno. Peace. And this is why everybody listening to this right now can find peace. Peace is the effortless byproduct of saying, I am in complete harmony with the way that everything is at this moment. It is a profound surrender and acceptance. I am not in resistance to the way that anything is. I'm not saying that's easy. I'm not saying that whatever your circumstances are, are to your personal subjective wanting. I'm not even saying that they're pleasant. But peace, if you want to find peace, you will every time hit that crescendo of inner liberation when you recognize there is nothing, nothing wrong with your circumstance. Nothing other than your conversation about it. And you are the generator of that conversation. Again, really clear. I'm not saying the circumstances are easy, but they're not wrong. They're just the way they are. Your bank account has got minus whatever or plus whatever. Your spouse is not talking to you. Your parents have disowned you. You just got fired. Your loved one is just being diagnosed with cancer. All circumstance. None of those things that I listed, and of course, there's thousands more iterations. None of them are wrong. They're just the way they are. And peace is me finding complete intimacy and acceptance with reality as the way it is versus my subjective narrative about the way I personally would like it to be. Right between there, that delta is the world of suffering. Wow. I, I have to tell you, but first off, everybody, I want to say one thing about you. When you hear Peter speak, it's, it's you know, for me, it's like, listen to some beautiful concert pianist, you know, the way he articulates his thoughts. And what, what I mean by that is that you say things I remember. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like profound truth, maybe hearing for the first time, because I think for millions of people right now, many of these thoughts they're hearing for the first time. And I find myself with you, brother, you know, I, I watch his social media, by the way, we're going to put it up on the screen, but go follow Peter on Instagram, go to his website because you're going to hear and see things there that will stick with you, that become part of your soul to some extent. And yeah. that, that dialogue that he just gave you about that space between suffering and peace and how to, how to find the one you want, which is peace, is something I would rewind and go back and play again and mm -hmm. share for people. 
Peter, I, I got to tell you, first off, I don't think I've ever had a show fly by this quickly, ever. <laughs> and I'm very, very grateful for you. You're a force for good in the world. Thank and you. You're special. You're unique. There's one of you. And I'm honored that we're becoming friends and that we shared this time together today. And you know what I like? I like that it was so good. Most people right now are going, I wish there was more. Mm -hmm. And there will be more. Peter and I are going to do some stuff together that you'll hear about down the road, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. We have him back on as well. So any final thought you want to share with everybody uh, before I let you go? Because I, I don't want to make I want to make sure I've at least got everything I can from you that we've emptied the tank, so to speak. Any any last thoughts for people right now during these times? Yeah, I feel, you know, first of all, I want to reflect your generous words to me. Uh, you know, we, we see in other that which we are ourselves, right? So I appreciate you. Uh, I'm very excited for the start of this relationship and friendship. Um, and thank you for noticing just like, you know, that I, I just am a quote unquote force for good. Like I, I realized at a very young age that one of my superpowers was caring. You know, I just, and at times it was like my downfall. Like it really hurt me because I didn't always get what I wanted. And I was like, it doesn't make sense because I just care so much, whether it was the girl I was trying to get or the client or the job and it hurt, you know? And then I realized, no, caring, which is synonymous with love is our inherent nature. And the degree to which we don't care and we don't love is the degree to which we suffer. <laughs> and so I just really feel blessed that I get platforms like yours to, express whatever it is that I see. And if it resonates with people, awesome. If it doesn't, that's okay. I'm still coming from love. And I just feel so blessed that I get to impact people. I wake up every day to DMs from people who were literally going to take their life, who heard something I said and they didn't, to somebody who might have had a more superficial issue of psoriasis and they heard how I helped somebody overcome like a psychological block that was manifesting in their body. And they have had it for two decades and now their psoriasis is gone. Like, you know, I just feel so humbled by the feedback and I hope that my words have resonated with your audience and that people really find relief from this because this isn't about me telling you people how to live their life. What I'm pointing out fundamentally is at the deepest level, there is literally, literally nothing wrong with anyone. And if we could come from that place of full acceptance of one another, if we could revere the life that we each are, starting with ourselves, then we would live on a very different planet. And that is my stand for humanity, is that we start to recognize the beauty, the gift that it is to be human and stop making each other wrong or bringing harm or any sort of oppression to each other because then we can all thrive. And that's where all boats rise with the tide. That's my commitment. Thank you for having me, Ed. I send so much love to everybody and I can't wait to connect in person. So grateful, brother. And by the way, last thing, there's another nugget in there, everyone. A lot of you should give yourself a little bit of grace. You're thinking, I don't know what my superpower is. What if it's caring? Yeah. What if your superpower is how much you love people? And yeah. uh, you certainly do, brother. And you're making such a huge difference in the world. Thank you. And everybody, yeah. remember this for me, too. If you're listening to this or watching it, follow me on Instagram every day at Ed Milet. I run the two-minute drill. I post every day at 730 Pacific time. Make a comment. Comment on other people's comments. In the first few minutes, you're in a drawing. If you miss that, just comment on all five posts I make every week at any time you want to. And I pick people to get max out gear, come get coached by me, meet my guests. Sometimes they fly on the plane and we talk, they get my book. It's really cool stuff. So engage with me as well at Ed Milet on Instagram. God bless you, everybody, and max out. Hey, guys, thanks for sticking around. If you'd like more, click the videos right here. They're exactly what you need to see next. And if you're new here, hit subscribe and become a part of the Max Out community. And tell me what you think about the videos in the comments below. I read all of them every week, and I select winners that get all kinds of prizes, gear, coaching calls with me. Make a comment.